Well, greetings, vinyl community. This is my second attempt at making this video. I uh, made an abortive attempt earlier today, but my voice was being drowned out by the damned leaf blowers outside. And when I become the tyrant dictator of the world, on day one, my first act will be to ban leaf blowers. It's raining today. How do you even blow the leaves away in the rain? They've got to be all sodden and sticking to the concrete, so it seems stupid. Anyway, Let's get on with it. Um, I've got some records to show, but first I do want to advise you that we have a Bandcamp Friday this week. Uh, I'm recording this on Thursday, so tomorrow is Bandcamp Friday. Uh, you may well be watching it on Friday, so you won't have to hesitate. You, yourself, can become one of the elite. You can be one of the cool kids by going to Bandcamp and purchasing one of these swell LPs that you see behind me, or purchasing more than one of these swell LPs that you see behind me. Or you could purchase some CDs. Or if you're tight on space, you can purchase some downloads. It's all good. I'll provide a link to the Bandcamp site in the description below. So let's get on with some new LPs, including this brand new release by Mary Halverson, the excellent uh, new jazz guitarist uh, of Code Girl notoriety. Uh, Cloudward is her new 2024 release on the Nunsuch label, and she has a sextet lineup here with an instrumentation of trumpet and trombone and vibes. Mary Halverson, of course, on guitar, plus bass and drums. And that combination of trombone and vibes, especially, gives it to me some of that uh, mid-70s Zappa or even Captain Beefheart uh, DNA. And uh, there's also some similarity to the things you'd hear on the Tzaddik label. So if you're a Zorn fan, if you're a Zappa fan, if you're a Beefheart fan, this is something to look into. She also has some violin on one track, uh, provided by none other than uh, Laurie Anderson. So that's a very cool inclusion. It goes, it fits right in very well with the uh, regular sextet performing on the rest of the album. So this is a great, great uh, album to start off the year of 2024. My first new release of the year uh, added to the collection. Going back to 1986, I uh, ran into a sealed copy of Scott Johnson's John Somebody. And this is an album that takes uh, spoken word, sort of uh, casual spoken word, um, uh, found dialogue sort of things, and loops it and sets it to a charging sort of King Crimson-esque rock backing. And uh, it's, it's a bit like some of the things that Robert Fripp did on the Exposure album, where he took some overheard dialogue bits and uh, put them to a rhythm track, except this takes it way farther and um, it has better fidelity on the recorded tracks because they're not done like through an apartment wall, which is so, one of the things that was happening on Exposure. So this is a really cool uh, example of the, the real breakdown between modern classical and post-rock music from 1986. That's an album that got a lot of publicity at the time it came out. It, it seemed like it was getting a lot of reviews, uh, a lot of hype, but it just didn't seem to stick around. And I did see Derek Higgins show that quite recently, so it was cool to uh, run into a, a brand new sealed, although cut out, copy of that uh, LP. Uh, from 1985, Klaus Schulze and his album Interface, this is on the Brain label, and one doesn't want to resist anything on the Brain label. Not the green, unfortunately, but the black Brain label. Not one of the best efforts in Klaus Schulze's catalog, I'm afraid. Um, the 
material on side one is too much um, influenced by the heavy beat sound, that monotonous four on the floor bass drum, and I have to wonder what the purpose of it is, because the music is resolutely undanceable. It sounds like it's an attempt at a, a disco kind of um, crossover, but it's really not. Maybe it's more trance than dance. Side two, the long title piece, 24 and a half minutes plus uh, a change, is a lot more interesting, I think, even though it still has a, um, a solid percussive uh, backbone to it. It's not mixed up uh, to the foreground so much, and it's tempered with some really interesting use of timpani throughout. So I think it's a much more successful um, way of uh, combining that beat with the spacey electronics. So side one, not bad. Side two, really quite good. From 1982, this great album by Peter Hamill, Enter K. And he's working with a quartet lineup here um, that he, he called the K Group. But I think if he wanted to, if he had wanted to, he could legitimately have called this a new incarnation of Van der Graaff Generator because three out of the four musicians were Van der Graaff veterans. Obviously, Hamill himself and Guy Evans on drums, who's on been in every lineup of Van der Graaff Generator, and Nick Potter on bass, who had been in the early Van der Graaff Generator, and then again rejoined the band for the short-lived uh, later incarnation when they were just called Van der Graaff, without the generator. And then the fourth musician is John Ellis on guitar. So that is the one sort of left turn away from Van der Graaff territory, where they'd never had a, a dedicated lead guitarist, and Peter Hamill himself had been the closest that they had. But um, he's playing mostly keyboards in this version, and you can see exactly what everybody's doing because they've helpfully included a track sheet, which is really cool. You can see exactly how they layered all these... Uh, very carefully and detailed arrangements. Uh, very rock album. Some very hard-hitting and very emotional stuff, as you always get from Hamill. And this happens to be, on the Mercury label, an Italian pressing. I uh, didn't even notice that when I picked it up. Includes the, uh, the long, epic closing track, Happy Hour. And... Um, a lot of songs that are familiar from Hamill's live shows. Great, great songwriting is something you always get on Hamill albums. That uh, This one has a lot of classic tracks. Chick Corea, Three Quartets, an album from 1981 on the Warner Brothers label. But it really could just as well be the kind of thing he was doing for ECM because he's sticking to acoustic piano here, uh, specifically Bosendorfer's. It gives you the low down in the liner notes back here uh, on the, uh, the technical details of the pianos he's using. And the quartet uh, performing these three quartets is Michael Brecker on saxophone, Eddie Gomez on bass, and Steve Gadd on drums, accompanying Chick Corea. And um, I think with Brecker and Gadd, there's a little, a little sense of wariness that this might be a bit too smooth, but it's not. These are great compositions, really nice compositional work from, from Chick Corea. So, three quartets from 1981. From 1980, Vangelis, Soil Festivities. This is one of his more spacey and more experimental albums. I love this one. I love this cover. This is totally my bag. All the little microscopy, uh, microphotography, the tiny organisms that, uh, that um, greatly outnumber us on this planet. That's definitely my bag. And the music um, 
is quite suitable to exploring that very alien world that surrounds us in the in the soil, in the waters, in the air. 1978 Brand X. I've never owned this album before in any form, and man what I was missing. This is a hell of a hot Brand X album. This is fantastic. Masks from 1978. It's a somewhat different lineup. Uh, it doesn't have Phil Collins on it. This is the one with just Chuck Berge doing all the drums. And Peter Robinson is the only keyboardist. Uh, Peter Robinson, of course, from Sun Treader and from Quatermass. Uh, Percy Jones, however, is still on bass. John Goodsell on guitar and Morris Pert on percussion. And the compositions are fantastic. The playing is just phenomenal. Great, great album. And here's an album from a couple of years earlier with a lot of Brand X DNA to it. Nova and their album Vimana. Nova is uh, an Italian prog fusion band, an offshoot of the prog band Osana. And on this album, the, uh, the band itself is credited as Corrado Rustici on guitar, Elio Dana on saxophones and synthesizers, our synthesized flute is actually what it says, so saxophone, flute, and synthesized flute, and Renato Rossit on keyboards, but they are joined by Percy Jones on bass, Phil Collins on percussion, and Michael Narado Walden on drums, plus Zakir Hussein. It says on congas. I would expect Zakir Hussein to be on tabla drums, but it says congas. It sounds like congas. This is really nice. So if you're into that uh, early Brand X sound, this is definitely in that wheelhouse. Um, different because of the prominent usage of reeds, but definitely fits in there. An album from 1977. Notice how I'm going back in time. I took a slight detour for that last album, but otherwise this is anti-chronological. That's my theme for today. Steve Hillage, Motivation Radio. Um, this is a little less proggy than his previous albums. It's not a masterpiece like Fish Rising, or L, but it's still nice. And there's a track called Light in the Sky with some really, really fun vocal contributions from Miquette Jordi, uh, Steve's partner. And definitely some, some references to Gong here and there. He hasn't forgotten about Gong. There's some, some uh, familiar riffs reappearing on this album. And of all things, it ends up with Buddy Holly. He ends up with Not Fade Away. Uh, Buddy Holly slash Rolling Stones slash Grateful Dead. But there you go. Steve Village, a little tarot on the back there, the chariot, along with uh, an Egyptian scarab. So that's, uh, that's our mysticism for the um, Steve Village. Billy Cobham from 1974. No, 1974? Is that right? I think I've got, yeah, 1974. I've got this out of order. Um, no matter, Total Eclipse. Really fine album, but quite varied. Uh, nothing as intense as Mahavishnu Orchestra, but he does fusion. He does music with really symphonic grandeur on here. The opening track fits in with that. And then it'll go into something else that's quite funky or something with a laid-back semi-reggae feel. A lot of variation and um, kind of unusually programmed. The album ends in this really sort of uh, inconclusive way. It's like, really? Is that the last track? 
very fine stuff from Billy Cobham. You can't go wrong. He's got John Abercrombie on guitar. He's got Mike Brecker, whom we heard from earlier on the Chick Corea album on saxes, and his brother Randy on trumpet. Uh, Glenn Ferris on tenor and bass trombones. So you can tell there's a lot of horn work. This is not obviously a drummer's album. The horns are definitely front and center. Uh, Milcho Lviv, I have no idea how to pronounce that. I'm, I'm sure that was wrong. Keyboards, Alex Blake on bass, and Billy Cobham on traps, timpani, and acoustic piano. Album by the Krautrock band Kron from 1975, Let It Out. Great playing on this. The music is a little variable. Some of it is quite proggy. Some of it is a bit on the funkier side, but still a really enjoyable album. And of course, uh, Helmet Hotler on bass is always worth listening to. And finally, back to 1974, I found a copy of Ricochet by Tangerine Dream. Not my favorite album by the classic lineup of Tangerine Dream, but all their albums are great. Um, it's presented as a live album, and that's really kind of a fiction. It's not really live. I think most of it is studio recordings that's been spliced together or layered with live recordings. Um, 1974, and this, uh, I already had this album as a reissue, and then I found this edition, this is not an original, but it's the Virgin International Pressing, so it's sort of a semi-original 70s pressing. It'll do till something uh, even more uh, primal comes along. So, that's what I have to show today. Thanks very much for watching. Go to band camp. Get rid of these albums that are cluttering up my apartment so I can make more. <laughs> Thanks very much. Bye-bye for now. Be well. Talk with you again soon.